Hello and let's talk about the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. The biggest free trade agreement in the world, the RCEP was signed into effect on Sunday and it will have quite an impact on the region. 15 countries signed it, the 10 countries of the ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and China, Australia, New Zealand, Japan and South Korea. The deal has been discussed for nearly 8 years now. Trade unions and people's movements have actually raised a number of issues about it in the past as well. This includes the impact the deal would have on labor rights, trade unions, agricultural production, marketing, etc. The negotiations were held in deep secrecy and until certain documents were leaked a few years ago, no one had any idea of what was happening. In India, there was a lot of domestic pressure by farmers' movements, trade unions and merchants' organizations, which finally led to the country withdrawing from the agreement last year before it was signed. However, India's quandary on this continues as its role in trade cannot be dealing from the larger geopolitical issues in the region. On this issue, we bring you a conversation between Benny Kurvila on Focus on the Global South, Professor Bishwaji Dhar, a trade expert from the Jawaharlal Nehru University and NewsClick's Prabir Purkaista. Uh, Dr. Dhar, your thoughts about what this means for India to be left out of two big trading blocks, both the RCEP and the CPTPP. The RCEP declaration also allows India to rejoin uh, immediately if so it wishes. So, I mean, the rhetoric that you see in the papers is that India is going to be isolated from the next round of, of globalization. So, your concluding thoughts on what it means for India's trade strategy going forward? Yeah, I think I think uh, in India is now, uh, 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 the government of India has now decided to adopt a set of policies which are completely inconsistent with any further engagements in this uh, in these these agreements you know uh, i don't see how the atmanirbhar abhiyan and the liberalization that rcep or any other of these bilateral agreements are talking about they can sit together uh, and uh, as far as uh, 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 you know india's future is concerned i think you know either way we would have we would have had uh, significant trouble because uh, from, from what we have seen uh, from the implementation of the three FTAs with the East Asian uh, uh, countries that we have, ASEAN, Japan, and Korea, India has lost out big time. Now, uh, and uh, uh, with the uh, uh, commitments under RCEP, uh, and the commitments under RCEP had to be very deep. So like 90% plus elimination of tariffs, which would have opened up agriculture sector as well. And, and that would have been very difficult for India to uh, to accept. So I think that if the business as usual continues for India, which is that we are not focusing on really turning around our real sectors, agriculture and industry, we are not trying to make our ag these sectors, uh, you know, sort of efficient and dynamic. We are not building this into the uh, the, the the processes. I do not think India can participate in any of these agreements with any degree of hope that they're going that it is going to be benefiting from these agreements. So I, I, I know I'm I'm someone who actually sits between the two extremities because there is one set of people who say, you know, we should have joined RCEP, and there will other other set of people who always say that we should not actually liberalize. I've always been maintaining that. We should, we should be looking at the global processes, but after strengthening our own, or putting our own house in, in, in order and strengthening our own industries. But that has not happened. When this will be happening, we don't know. And, and till such time uh, uh, it happens, I think political compulsions will keep India out of all these uh, trade arrangements. i just add to okay. the saying by... So, uh, bringing out that if we believe that isolation is going to help us, it won't. Because unfortunately, in today's world, technology and goods are required for even developing your own sectors in the way you want. So having barriers, making it more expensive is one issue. It's not going to, either, you know, 50s, 60s, you could do that because the the, the amount of uh, complexity in technology was relatively less. So was the specialization in technology relatively less, not so today. So therefore, being out of uh, global trade 
not being out, but having a larger cost to go with global trade, which may happen without strength and strengthening the way Vishwajit was talking is one element. The other element of it is that you are allowing free flow of capital. On that, there seems to be no bar. And therefore, you are really combining two very dissimilar things. We are also making us open to digital monopolies of all kinds. We have allowed Facebook and uh, Google to invest huge amounts in Geo, which is today the telecom monopoly. So we are seeing what Vishwajit just said, disjointed policies and no vision. And I think that is the bigger problem, rather than should we or should we not join ourselves. Thank you, Prabir and Professor Dharg for sharing your insights. The RCEP has just been signed. It will take some time for the ratification process, maybe up to two years. But given the twin challenges of the pandemic, the economic recovery, how India plays out its own strategies, and you've underlined uh, the importance of domestic, industrial, and sort of digitization strategies for that, it remains to be seen how all of this will pan out. In our next story, we bring you a segment of a conversation on the spike in COVID-19 cases in Europe. Most of Europe is going through a massive and more deadly spike in COVID-19 than the last time. In fact, if you look at the number of cases yesterday, six of the top 10 countries in that list are from Europe. And this includes Germany, Italy, France and the UK. Italy, France and UK all recorded over 500 deaths too. The governments of Europe did have an opportunity after the first wave of COVID-19 to put in place some measures to prepare. However, they failed to do that. In this interview, Alexis Benos, the People's Health Movement activist from Greece, explains how and why the governments failed to take the necessary action. So now we, we are coming today, and it is this is the very sad, I think, that instead of pushing some more, let's call them socialist policies towards health and health service and so on, in all Europe, the, the governments didn't care about that. They didn't do anything about the public health services. And actually, they used the pandemic crisis as an opportunity to expand the private sector in all countries also. For example, which is an aberrant issue. In UK, they have um, outsourced the surveillance system. I mean, it's outsourced in private companies, in different private companies, which every company has its own system of recording, you know. So this is uh, for epidemiology and public health is a nonsense because you cannot have a uh, homo homogenized uh, system of data Absolutely. that you can, you know, see what is happening and uh, evaluate and inference of, or that we have to do that or that or the other. So this is a, one thing. Here in Greece, the government said that they are going to use the uh, intensive care unit beds because we have a Greece is the, the lowest in the European Union in rates with beds per population. So they said, okay, don't worry, we're going to use the beds of the private sector. And said, okay, that's a, that's a step. But after that, they said, okay, we are going to pay the, the private sector. And actually, they doubled the rate of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Just within the crisis, they doubled. And they said, okay, we're going, but we have to pay them more. So this is the the old approach, and we are going. So we are uh, we are today in the se in the middle of the second wave, which is, as you know, it is. Uh, I mean, even greater than what we were thinking of. I mean, we are expecting a second wave, but this is much bigger uh, in in quantity and in the strength of incoming the society, and we are literally. I am prepared for that. In all countries of Europe, I say, I, again, uh, nothing has been done. So today, <clears throat> we are again in the same situation. And as you know, for example, here in Greece, we are now one week in lockdown. Austria today was get to lockdown. Lockdown is coming back as uh, the, only, the only solution because we don't have to uh, do anything. And here, we are going to another issue regarding health, I mean, because it's not only to care for the people who are ill from uh, COVID or uh, whatever other listen, but also to see the uh, factors that are determining health, which is the social determination of health. And this pandemic, as we know already, is a big, uh, big danger for the 
massive health of the, of the population because it is driving masses of the population in impoverishment, okay, in uh, uh, famine actually, in Europe, we are speaking about Europe, in famine, so, and all this, uh, actually, now, these days, we are discussing in Greece and other countries that they are going to be, how you say that, expulsed by their houses because they, you know, they, they cannot pay the, the rent or the, the borrow that they have done. Mm -hmm. So, all the, all the, so the, the factors, all the, the, the determinants of health, which are food, uh, house, and so on and so on, are hidden by right. the pandemic. So we are expecting much more problems of health because of the pandemic. So instead of doing that, what they are doing, I say again, in all <coughs> countries of Europe, is that they are turning, they are trying to, to keep in-house into the public health system uh, the problem of COVID patients. So they are destroying all the services for the other morbidity. Right. Okay, so this is another issue that we have already, and this is, have, has been counted uh, globally, I mean, we have an excess death rate of non-COVID diagnosis right. because there's no way to, to deal with heart problems or cancer problems or whatever, diabetes and so on. So we have a lot of morbidity that cannot be expressed, cannot be dealt with because there are no services. There are closing all services and are putting them under the COVID uh, issue. Uh, uh, now, uh, all this, uh, I, I repeat, it's a, a result of the neoliberal policies. In our view, I mean, our, I mean, not only the people's health movement, but also I'm speaking as a public health uh, specialist and epidemiologist and so on. The, the, the issue, which is global, it's not only European, the, the, very important issue is that we have lost globally the ability, what I said before, the ability, first of all, to re record data, what is happening, who is ill, who is becoming ill, where, what are his characteristics or her characteristics, socially, uh, work-wise, and so on and so on, in order to, to be able to control uh, the epidemic. And this is global, I repeat. I, I just want to, to stress, it's not European, but it is very important, that one metropolis, let's say, of our public health is the CDC, the Centers of Diseases Control in the United States, which is also dismantled, and they cannot deliver. We don't know. So today, what is happening, and this is very important also, is that the governments are making lockdowns, closing schools, or not closing schools, or whatever, whatever decisions, without any documentation, without any evidence. Actually here, and I think it is, uh, I heard that I'm hearing that it is in, in Europe, in, in a lot of European countries, the government try to victim blaming the people. So they are saying, they are, they are raising the issue of, that all this issue is a, a, an issue of personal responsibility. Okay, so it's you, the citizen, that is the fault of the citizen because you go out, because you are not putting your mask or whatever. And especially in Greece, they are using that against the youth. I mean, because, you know, the youth are going out and they are in the plazas with a beer, something like that. So they say, okay, look what is happening. These are the people that are... Uh, so they are using that against the population. They are... They're promoting the idea of personal uh, responsibility. You can watch both these interviews on NewsClick. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.